Welcome to Breaking Banks. Well, we continue our look back on 2021 and our look ahead at 2022 and beyond. And now uh, Greg Palmer joins us from Finnovate and host of the Finnovate podcast. So uh, Greg, we talked a lot about some of these things already uh, last week, but curious to get your perspective on what stood out for you in 2021, what were some of the highlights? What were some of the trends that you saw? And then um, we'll, we'll come around to kind of then forecasting what that's going to look like going into 2022. Yeah, thanks, JP. Really happy to connect as always. You know, 2021, pretty much just a garden variety, regular old boring year, right? Nothing really major <laughs> happened. So, you know, I don't know the, how much content we'll be able to get out of talking about what's happened last year, what's going to happen next year. It all seems pretty much humdrum from where I'm sitting. Um, no, I, of course. I'm a, yeah, where were you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was uh, turning digital conferences back into physical conferences, into hybrid conferences. You know, I think we've all kind of done this dance. And what was really, I think, probably at a really high level, the most interesting thing about 2021 is all of us sort of looking to find a way towards a new normal and, and what that actually means. And so you've got a lot of different competing ideas out there of as far as how often people are going to be doing their banking in person? Will people revert back to pre-pandemic habits? Will people be forever altered in the way that they do business? And I think, you know, everybody's just sort of in the same boat where we're all trying to figure out what's sustainable, what can we actually build on and where do we see some patterns that look like they're going towards the right direction? So we can talk a little bit about that, but overall, I think it was a year of kind of the industry finding itself a little bit and everybody trying to figure out what we could do that would help everybody move forward. And um, you know, we all got sort of sick of stagnation in 2020 that clearly isn't going to sustain anybody for long. So how can we move forward? And that was, I think really the fundamental question of last year. Yeah, and, and one of the things that stood out for Brad and Jason and, and me too was just the, the level of fintech funding, right? Biggest year yeah. ever and uh, more unicorns than ever. Uh, you know, one in five VC dollars are now going into fintech. It, it really is everywhere. And I, I, I'm sure you're seeing that with the fintech companies you have coming across the Finnovate stage as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see the amount of funding going into the space and I think it's clear why it's going into that space. I think we're going to have to come up with a different word than unicorn. There are just too many of them now. Mm -hmm. There's herds of unicorns out there, I suppose, which yeah. sort of defeats the purpose of the name. But no, certainly there's been a huge number of really high profile, successful companies in the fintech space, and that's pulling other venture capital money in. I think the real question is going to be where that VC money goes, whether it's kind of prospecting, looking at early stage, you know, seed level series A fundings, or whether we're going to see a lot of, you know, series Bs and Cs, people trying to delineate the winners and pile on and, and really fund those companies as well. And, and probably it'll be some combination, but for my money, I think we're due for a little bit more prospecting, a little more early stage investing, because there are some really creative solutions out there. And I really hope that's where a lot of this influx of new venture capital ends up going. Well, I agree with you there. I, I think, you know, Jason Henricks is our resident VC on the show, so I, I'll let him speak for himself. But I can tell you through the Alloy Alchemist Fund, what we like to say is that the companies we're investing in, we like to look at those that are reinventing banking, not those that are replumbing banking. And I, I think a lot of the high dollars have gone into the re in uh, re, replumbing part mm -hmm. and not shocking, right? There's a lot of replumbing that's needed to be done. Uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, this, this, one of the other things we, we talked about a little bit is, you know, this ongoing phrase of digital transformation, you know, what does that even mean and how, who signs up for it? And, um, you know, when's there an end to it because there never is. Uh, but really looking at how do we reach a different set of customers? How do we provide a different set of value propositions to those customers? And I think, you know, that's what I find the most interesting. So I hope you're right that um, some more of these dollars are going to go, go towards breaking some more new ground. Yeah, well, we've certainly seen people who've been tackling problems creatively getting rewarded for that. And I think that's something which is really good to see because that's not always the case, right? Creativity isn't always rewarded, but I think we're seeing it, it becoming more so in the fintech space. And I think, you know, I, I have a very similar viewpoint to you. I look at it kind of from the end user's perspective, that end customer's perspective and think what's going to actually change somebody's life? 
what type of new product or new service can we offer that's going to really fundamentally change somebody's life? And there are obviously a lot of inefficiencies and problems that still persist in the way that we take care of our money. And there's, a, there's room in fintech for people who are trying to do things that have always been done, but do them a little bit quicker, a little bit better, right? The loan origination process springs immediately to mind. This is still an area that requires a lot of overhauling and, and really just a lot more attention on the customer experience. But when you look beyond this kind of optimizing of existing products and services and start to think, what do we not have that we could have or should have? That's where you start to see some really big scale innovations coming through. You know, I think back to when we first were looking you know, in 2012, 2013, the idea, take a picture of a check to deposit it. That's a life changer. You know, tap to pay. That's a life changer, right? There, there are various hardware innovations that allowed people to do more. Um, you know, think scanning your face with a, to, to log in, like all this biometric authentication didn't used to be possible. And we're at a moment now where maybe the hardware isn't changing as much, but customer behavior is changing. And there's a real opportunity now that people are more open to fintech solutions on a global scale than I think they ever have been. We've sort of been pushed into it. But people who've tried it, enjoy it, is a lot of people getting a lot of press, you know, investing in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and things like that. It's become something that's more top of mind. And that's a real opportunity. It's a real opportunity for somebody to come in and say, okay, we've got a customer base who's open to this, who's eager for more of this. What can we really offer them that they want? And so, you know, I think a lot of people are spending time studying and doing research on what consumers actually want, what we can offer them. And the people who end up having those, that, that next big idea, I think this is a really right moment for something along those lines, because this is a, a really unique situation in history where we've kind of got everybody's attention. And so now it's up to the industry to say, well, what are we going to do with it? Well, and certainly the pandemic helped accelerate that. Oh, yeah. Let's continue to pull on that thread. Talk in maybe a little bit more specifics about some of the things you saw uh, at Finnovate this year and, you know, the kinds of companies, the kinds of categories and, um, you know, who are some of the people uh, that are making those kinds of differences that you're talking about? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think one place that's really interesting to look is the Finnovate Awards. We've now done our third annual Finnovate Awards show. Um, and that's been really fun. It's been an interesting project because we're able to engage with companies who aren't quite right for the Finnovate stage. You know, these are companies who don't have a product that they can demo necessarily in seven minutes, but who still do a lot of work and that work deserves to be recognized. Um, and what was really interesting was some of the, the really popular categories this year were not necessarily the categories that we expected to be popular. Um, you know, I think embedded finance was one that kind of caught us by surprise. And that's really just sort of indicative of how that category has grown, even since we, you know, we opened the application window in February. And we sort of, you know, those sort of early days of what embedded finance was, you hear people talking about it. We thought, okay, let's put it out there. Let's see what we get back. It ended up being one of the most popular categories uh, that we that we had last year. And there's a huge variety in the way people defined embedded finance, which was also really interesting. It's clear it's still early enough that there's a lot of ambiguity in what that phrase actually means. Um, and so the sheer volume of people who are playing in that space or who want to be playing in that space, I think was really interesting. And it'll be fun to watch as we get more of a consensus definition on what that actually means. But from our standpoint, you know, we were kind of picking winners and thinking maybe we're defining this category a little bit right now, just based on what all of our judges think. So that was, I think, a really interesting one that uh, that we could probably unpack for a little bit more. Um, well, there are a few others as well. <laughs> and 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 I'm just wondering, maybe 2022 is the year we actually start to define some terms uh, in right. in, um, in 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 commonality instead of just buzzwords. Our friends uh, Ron Shevlin and and colleagues at Cornerstone Advisors, along with Nimbus, published uh, what they call the definitive guide to potentially misunderstood fintech trends and terms. And uh, embedded finance is on there on page 32 if you're looking for it. And you know their definition is embedded finance is the integration of financial services into non-financial websites, mobile apps, and business processes. And they go on to point out that the umbrella term, though, does gloss over deep distinctions between embedded payments, lending, mm -hmm. banking, and insurance, however. And they have an example of like a, a, a lift page, right, where, you know, you have uh, not only faster payments, but rewards, seamless account opening, it's all integrated. I mean, it, it just goes all the way back to, um, you know, the idea of that, you know, 
banking as as Brett King coined many, many years ago now, right? Banking is no longer somewhere you go. It's something you do, but it's something you do not necessarily even with a bank any longer, right? As A16Z right. put it, every company is a fintech company um, at, at, at this point. And, you know, Jason um, just started off a little bit of a tweet storm himself this week. We, we we're working with a bunch of banks around banking as a service. You know, even that as a term, same thing. How, how do we define yeah. that? And and that's in uh, the Cornerstone Guide as well. But uh, I, I, I digress a little bit, but you bring up a good point that, um, you know, you're seeing nominations uh, on people making big things in areas that, um, you know, maybe we should have some common definition of what, what does that even mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly I think, you know, to your point, there's a lot that we can look at is, you know, maybe traditional banking services, services which used to be offered by banks. But I think that's a definition which is going to have really limited value as we go forward. And more and more different types of companies are able to offer products which are nominally financial products. Um, and so, you know, I think embedded finance is going to be a key one. A couple others that were really popular last year, um, back end and core solutions was a really popular category, which I think is something a lot of us in this space have really been waiting for for a long time, right? We've sort of been, uh, you've seen the limiting effect that outdated back-end banking processes have and the way that people are now reinventing that from a core banking standpoint is really interesting and I think potentially opening doors to a lot of other types of fintech. Um, two other really popular categories, customer experience continues to be something people are really thinking a lot about. No surprise, competition is fiercer than ever and people's expectations are higher than ever, especially as we live more and more of our lives online. And then the pandemic response category was really popular as well. And that was sort of one of those heartwarming moments where, you know, I was able to read through a lot of the ways that people in a variety of backgrounds had really tried to look at, you know, what services can we offer to help people deal with this massive problem that is the pandemic. And there were so many different types of solutions there. I think that's one where, you know, it felt really uh, unfortunate that we only could pick one winner or even you know, five or six finalists because there's so many good ones, everything from you know, making sure we're you know, waiving fees for customers who want it, making the in-branch experience safer, looking at new products or small businesses in particular who are getting hit really hard and how we can keep those guys afloat. So that was, I think, you know, if there was a heartwarming moment in 2021 for me, reading through that category of nominees was, was excellent. Um, and I think it just, it just made me proud to work in financial technology and see what everybody else is working on there. Well, those are good examples of real country, uh, customer centric development. At the same time, they, they also sound a lot like kind of the replumbing uh, pieces too, yes. right? How, how do we make an incremental little change to what we've been doing for decades, if not centuries? So mm -hmm. um, interesting to see um, the, the, the changes. So I, that's where something like embedded finance resonates a little bit more to me. And it, it but at the same time, I understand that's a big change. If 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 your job is, uh, hey, we're a bank and we provide banking right. services, which leads us right back into banking as a service. Well, and certainly not every financial institution did that much. You know, I think there were a lot of companies who really looked at the problem and said, "We're going to help our customers through it." And there were a lot of companies who just sort of said, "Not our problem." And I think that's where you really kind of have to give credit to the people who did try. And some of them you kind of look at and say, well, maybe that's about the bare minimum you could do. Some of them you look at and think, oh, that's actually a, a quite creative solution um, that had a big impact. It seems to me though, that um, this pandemic has gone on way too long already yeah. for all <laughs> of us. And I think the few that thought we, you know, we don't have to change, we can just ride this out. Um, I, I don't know of any stories, maybe you have some, but I, I don't think that's worked out well for any of them. I, I think the companies that truly have adapted and changed uh, business models and uh, product features are, are really the ones that are winning. And, and you know, as you said earlier, uh, I think everybody's still trying to figure out what the new normal is. And, and I, I don't think we've reached it yet, whatever it is, but it's certainly not the old normal. No, definitely not. And I think, you know, it's one of the, it's the age old story, right? There are people who aren't doing as much and I think they are getting, uh, they're they are seeing some customer bleed as a result of that. I think one interesting thing that's going to be fascinating to watch as we start to come out the other side, we know the pandemic has had the effect of kind of dampening people's appetite for life changes. You know, people aren't moving their homes. Uh, they aren't, uh, well, they've just recently sort of started switching jobs again, but there was a sort of everybody hunkering down kind of mentality in a very literal sense, obviously. 
and now it's going to be interesting to see as people start to come out the other side, you know, will banks that are kind of having a slow bleed of customers who are leaving, will that accelerate? Will people be more open to making changes in financial areas of their life? And obviously, a lot of fintech is getting more press. People are investing um, potentially actually really unwisely and being successful at it. And so they're making headlines as a result of that. You know, I bet hard on AMC. Yay. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily going to spur intelligent financial changes, but I think there will be a growing wave of people who, as we start to come out of the pandemic, look at making some of these big changes in their lives. And so you wonder, you know, will that slow trickle of customers flowing away turn into a flood as people get more comfortable and feel like they have a, a more replicable status quo? I don't know, but that's where I would be betting right now. Well, I think that's a really interesting thought. I, I think we're still early, but it does appear that there is a nascent trend where we're looking at, you know, low unemployment and it's uh, people are leaving crappy jobs and yeah. looking for better jobs. It's never been better uh, for job seekers right now. And uh, we're, we're seeing an increase in uh, strike activity again for workers. Mm -hmm. Workers are really uh, kind of beginning to, to take back power and, and take control and change things that are difficult. And um, changing banks is difficult, but it's not harder than changing jobs. And so if people are, are willing to do that, you know, maybe you're right. Um, may, maybe what was not very good, but you know, inertia uh, kept attrition down. Uh, maybe, you know, we, we've reached exit velocity here for a lot more customers in 2022. Yeah, that, that said, I did just have a conversation with one of my relatives over uh, the Christmas break here. And I, she just switched banks and I asked her, why she switched. And she said she picked one that had an ATM close to her house. So, you know, maybe not, <laughs> maybe this will, uh, that is a circa 1999 response, financial. isn't it? Right. I know. I was like, come yeah. on, you, there's so many options out there. How can you just pick based on who has an ATM? What do you even need that for? Well, I used um, to keep an anyway. eye on, uh, th that survey. Um, uh, you know, there, there are a couple common surveys of, you know, why people change and yeah, it was branch or ATM near me was number one for years and years and years. Yeah. And that finally stopped about five years ago, um, where that wasn't number one, but it's, it's not down to zero yet. Some, some people are, are, are still choosing that. <laughs> well, what are you looking forward to in 2022, both in the macro and in, in the trends, but also in the Finnovate world? Yeah, well, I think from the Finnovate side, which is maybe a little bit easier to tackle, you know, with, with Finnovate fall last year, we found a new hybrid model where we were able to bring a number of people together in uh, Midtown Manhattan, um, which was really great. Being able to be back in person, having the live stage there, I thought was really good and really fun. Um, obviously, it was not as well attended as it had been in years previous, but there was also a significant number of people who were watching online. And this kind of hybrid conference model is one that's really difficult. And I think a lot of people have struggled in very high profile ways with it. But we felt like Finnovate Fall was a really good iteration of that. It gave us something to build off of. And so now we're looking forward to doing, you know, our, our kind of big three conferences in a very similar way. Finnovate Europe coming up here in March. That one will be in London. Finnovate Spring in San Francisco in May. And then Finnovate Fall back in New York in September. And all of them will be available digitally. So you know, we're hoping that things continue to open up a little bit. Um, we get past this kind of current wave and people feel more comfortable gathering in person again. We still expect there'll be a number of people who either won't be able to travel or who aren't comfortable traveling. And so we wanna make sure we're able to bring those people in as well. And I think we've got a good model that allows us to do that. And I think one of the things that we've really seen over the course of 2021 is the market can't sit still. There's not enough time to be able to say, okay, we're just going to hold off. We're not going to go out there and promote ourselves in this way. Um, it, that's clearly just not an option. And so we're really happy to be able to offer an event space that allows people to connect, whether it's in person, whether it's digitally, allows good products, good innovations to become more widely known in the space. Um, because quite frankly, the industry needs it. And so it's something that we're really pleased to be able to do. I think that's going to be a really fun one to watch over the course of this year. Hopefully, by the time we come out of 2022, we're in a little bit of a different spot. We're able to kind of get back to the traditional conference circuit. Although, just like with a lot of finance, I'm not sure we'll ever go all the way back to the way things used to be. I think there are going to be pieces that we're trying out that people enjoy. So, um, I'm looking forward to another year, another way, another opportunity to kind of solidify exactly what that hybrid model looks like and bring more people in. Um, this is the part where I probably plug 
all of our events. Check out Finnovate.com if you would like to become involved. We're currently taking sponsors, demoers, speakers, and of course, attendees. If you're interested in getting involved, let us know. Um, but I think that's, so from a Finnovate standpoint, that's something that is gonna be really interesting to watch. Um, in a more macro sense, you know, what am I excited about from the fintech industry as a whole? I think really it's this battle for customer attention. I think the, the competition is heating up. Customer experience continues to be a massive battleground. And we're seeing it shift away from now, how pretty is that app? You know, how intuitive is it? How easy is it to use? To this deeper underlying question, what does it do? What can it do for people? And this competition to make consumers' lives better can only be a good thing for the entire industry. So that's, I think, the, the big piece that I'm really looking forward to. This increased competition is going to drive innovation. It's going to drive creative solutions. And ultimately, the people who are going to win are going to be the end users. And that's kind of who we at Finnovate have always sort of identified with. Our goal has always been to just drive the industry to put better solutions out there so that everybody can enjoy a better financial future. And how are you helping those fintech companies, you know, get their message out besides giving them a chance to, to be on the Finnovate stage? Yeah, well, I think one thing that we do, um, which I am quite proud of as well, I do a lot of coaching with the companies who come across our stage. Um, and obviously I've seen a fair few demos at this point at the risk of tooting my own horn too aggressively, which is a phrase I immediately regret saying. I feel like there's a lot that we can offer to help companies get the word out there in a really constructive way. You know, I think there's this misconception in the space that you have to be, you know, a showman or a salesperson in order to be able to deliver a good presentation, but that's not really the case. You know, you can come from a wide variety of backgrounds and deliver a presentation, which is going to fulfill your business objectives. Now, obviously, if you are a natural showman, then great, you'll have that advantage, but a lot of people in the financial technology space are more comfortable with computers, not necessarily comfortable in front of large audiences like you find at our stage. And there are a lot of really, you know, not, not simple, but um, replicable tips and tricks that you can use to make that process less scary. Um, and, and this actually is something which I'll be doing in 2022 as well. I'll be starting to offer this coaching outside of those companies that are going to be on stage at Finnovate. So, you know, I've done a couple with accelerators at this point where we talk to a variety of companies and kind of give a, you know, demoing 101 type of course, one-on-one -on -one with a specific company is also definitely a possibility as well. But if you're interested in learning more about that, just hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to do it. And, and as anybody who I've worked with will tell you, it really is a passion of mine. I think one of the things that really grates on me more so than, than a lot of other problems in fintech is when I see this missed connection, I see a company on stage with good technology. I see people in the audience who I know will benefit from that technology and they're not able to connect because the seven minute demo doesn't quite go the right way. And, and that's really frustrating for me, both as a conference organizer and as an individual who will end up not getting that product <laughs> and, uh, that, that I might've seen. So it's yeah. a, definitely a labor of love. Well, as a many, many, many time attendee, um, I, I can feel a little bit of that pain myself sometimes. Like, oh, I know there's something good in there, but you're yeah. not telling me. And sometimes it's it's the focusing on the what instead of the why um, yeah. and, and kind of telling me a lot more about how it works and, you know, what all the connections do. And I just really want to understand what problem is this solving for whom. It, but then the flip side of it is, um, to your earlier point, there's such a thing as too glib too. Right. <laughs> right. I, I've seen, uh, you know, really slick uh, people that also didn't uh, sway me because um, yeah, I, I just sensed, I, I want to know a little bit more about what actually was happening, not just that, you know, it, it looks good and they sound good and all of that kind of stuff. So I, I think that's a service that's uh, needed and, and particularly uh, for newer startups that are maybe not used to, um, you know, kind of pitching to others, they, they built yeah. something really cool, but you got to be able to share it with others. Well, no matter who you are in the industry, you will eventually find yourself standing in front of a room full of people and you will be tasked with making them care. Whether it's a room full of venture capitalists, whether it's a room full of bankers, whether it's a gigantic audience, you'll be up there and you'll have to make people care. And that's one of the hardest things to do because especially when you care so deeply about it, when you've got so much writing on it, um, it's really hard to separate yourself out. And I think the, the stat is still out there that more people 
are afraid of public speaking than are afraid of dying, um, which is, you know, I, I promise you as bad as it ever goes up there, you will not die on stage. Yes, we're, we're still uh, zero deaths. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Keep that well, going. So on the calendar, next up is uh, Finovate Europe in London, yeah. March 22nd and 23rd, and then back in San Francisco on May 18th and 20th. And I don't think I'm going to make it to London this year, but I am planning of being there in San Francisco. So I'll look forward to, to seeing you there. Um, before we uh, finish up here, Greg, talk about the Finnovate podcast. What uh, You've had some great guests on lately, uh, and I know you have some more coming up. Uh, give us a little bit uh, of an idea what to look forward to on your show. Yeah, thanks. I think the, the Finnovate podcast has been fun. It's been kind of a labor of love for me, as, as you know. Um, my favorite thing about it is I just get to have conversations with a lot of really interesting people. And, you know, typically we tend to focus on um, best of show winners from previous events. So founders or CEOs of companies who've been successful on our stages. We talk a lot with venture capitalists, with analysts. So we try and give this uh, a combination of the bigger picture trends. You know, you can look at analysts, you can look at where a venture capitalist is investing, um, and get a sense of kind of the overall ecosystem. I also like to get kind of down and dirty with a specific company who's had some success and figure out what makes them successful and what others can take away from that. So, you know, we'll be looking to do more of the same in 2022. Um, I think, you know, one of the really fun parts for me has been there's just been an increase in the number of guests who've been reaching out, uh, which is always fun. They started to come to me now. And so I can be maybe a little bit more choosy with who is able to get a slot up there. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the fundamental unifying thread is just conversations that, you know, I find interesting, I guess. And I'm fortunate enough that people, that other people seem to find them interesting too. There are no shortage of fascinating people in the FinTech space. And, and I always enjoy talking to people who are just brilliant and you can learn something from just about anybody. And as part of the fun of it is talking to people ahead of time and saying, you know, what's unique about you? What brings you to a point where you have something to offer to the space, to the industry as a whole? And in many cases, you know, people who have something really interesting aren't even always aware of what's interesting about themselves. You kind of get to go on that journey of discovery together. And that's where it can be really fun and you can get to something which uh, can give have a really good conversation. And of course, you know, it's only 15 minutes. So uh, hopefully everybody has time to just listen to a quick conversation once a week. Well, it's one of my favorite listens, and you can listen to the Finnovate podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms, or you can find out more at provoke.fm, and you can find Greg on uh, Twitter, on LinkedIn, and at finnovate.com. So Greg Palmer, uh, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, JP. Thanks for having me. Okay. Hey, hey, it is Amber here, and I'm so excited today to get to talk with Joseph Mancini, goes by Joe. Um, Joe is the EVP and Chief Operating Officer of Bank Prov, which is a $1.6 billion institution based in Amesbury, Massachusetts. You've probably heard of Bank Prov. They've been making a ton of waves lately uh, with all that they're doing in the crypto space, and so we're here to kind of dig into you know the, the basis of this transformation so thanks so much for coming on joe i appreciate it thank you so much amber for having me on i appreciate it yeah of course so you you came from radius bank which is another really well-known bank in the innovation space um and just joined bank prop pretty recently so would love to hear a little bit about that transition and if there's anything that is sort of in the dna of both of those banks that that you can identify that perhaps makes them prone to innovation yeah so you know fortunately i've been here for about 18 months just about a little over a year and a half at bank prov and uh, yes i did come from radius bank and uh which is now lending club bank um and you know i think the, there's certainly some similarities in how we approach things in terms of uh culture and perhaps um speed at, at which we we approach the, the the initiatives and get things out to market but um you know i think there's there's certainly a lot of differences as well and i i think the our, our backgrounds um you know particular working as as leaders in the space and, and kind of getting ahead of the curve and some of these, these uh, initiatives in particular around crypto and fintech and bass and some of the spaces that are out there today so would you say that um i'm very curious about the leadership aspect any any bank that kind of is a you know pioneer in this space i'm always curious to learn about the ceo and the board and um what you may have learned from them and again kind of i guess a similar question about kind of the dna of the leaders the the individuals who kind of take on massive change in a financial institution 
Yeah, I think it starts, and we, we throw the, the culture term out there a lot, and I, it's kind of cliche at this point, but it really is a big part of it because, you know, you can, you can go out there and build this phenomenal strategy, but if you're, if you're a team and, and the, those that support the initiatives and the strategy aren't on the same page, it, culturally, it's just not going to fit. So it starts there. I think our, our CEO, Dave Mansfield, has been with the bank for a number of years, um, saw an opportunity years ago to really get into the crypto space and, you know, and jumped right in. Right. So it's, it's, uh, our board fully supported it. They were on the same page. They saw an opportunity there as well. Um, I think for us, it's at the leadership level, it's about having, um, this just business enabling risk minded approach, knowing that we're in a situation where maybe there isn't full clarity in the regulatory perspective, but, uh, we're getting there at some point. Um, but from a leadership perspective, it's, it's really, um, just the communication is critical to our teams. And again, I, I go back to speed, of, uh, speed to market, just knowing that there's a lot to pick up here and, and we're starting to see some, some other banks and, and, uh, um, alike trying to get into the space as well. So it's really about believing in your strategy, believing in your culture, and then really living it as well. Yeah. Well, lack of clarity is right. I just um, had a lovely weekend listening to the four and a half hour congressional hearing on cryptocurrency recently and um, kind of distilling all of that for um, for the banks who are members of the Alloy Labs Alliance and certainly have a long way to go in terms of regulatory clarity. But I want to double click on you know what you said about taking a risk minded approach to new spaces like this. So you come from a, a fraud and you know chief information security officer and an enterprise risk background. I know Dave is a former regular a former examiner with um, the FDIC and the OCC. So um, if anyone's set up to, to to wade into risky spaces, I would think it would be the two of you. Yeah, it's a good team. Um, I, I think again, we're fortunate to have the right the right folks with us there as well. But yeah, I think our experience in that space, we get that there's risk clearly, right? And and you know, our focus point as an organization is really set up in three specific areas, in particular in the deposit and the lending side. But we are a traditional commercial bucket um, in products and services. There, we have VAS and fintech, and then we've got our crypto piece of it as well. So each of those dissected have their own risks associated with them, and and as part of the approach for us, it's, you know, having open communication with our examiners and that's the FDIC in our end, um, ensuring that they get a full understanding of that way. There's no surprises when they do come in to do a safety and soundness exam and to conduct that. Um, audit partners are critical as well. You know, and I think for us, it's, it's about the messaging and really understanding the risks, uh, identifying them. You know, how do we proceed there? Do we mitigate it? Do we accept the risk? That's a critical part of the process. Um, but I think for us is risk we see as an opportunity. And that's something that we've we've always believed and will continue to, to take that approach as well. Yeah. So the bank, you know, let's go ahead and dig into some of the programs since you mentioned those kind of three buckets. So I, I think I first talked to Dave uh, a year, maybe two years ago when the rebrand was very fresh, moving from the Provident Bank to the Bank Prov brand with that lovely pink um, branding that, that definitely yeah. sticks out. So I think you first announced that you were working with crypto assets in 2019. The rebrand happened in 2020. And when I first spoke with Dave, I remember we had this conversation about um, really just being a depository institution for crypto companies, which are, you know, in some ways a lot like any other commercial entity. But the, you know, at the time it was kind of a challenge because you have all these amazing deposits on one side of the balance sheet, kind of difficult to find things to deploy those to on the opposite side of the balance sheet with the regulators being so, um, you know, concerned, if you will, about the volatility of, of crypto as the underlying asset there. I think you guys have probably grown by leaps and bounds and sophistication and figuring that out at this point, because not only are you holding deposits for crypto companies, but also lending um, with crypto as the as the you know asset on the back end and have actually launched your own exchange, which is something that is a huge technological undertaking. So wondering, Joe, if you can walk me through kind of the evolution from those early, you know, basic deposit products to what you guys are doing now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it started with, as you mentioned, kind of this unbanked portion of the industry that, that certainly is, is in dire need of, of banking services. And so 
you know, I think we always start out and say, okay, this, there's a potentially a deposit opportunity here, deposit play. And the more we explored, the more we had conversations with some of these partners and some of the clients on our end, it was clear that there was a few particular areas, you know, payment services, uh, access to payment rails, and some of these pain points that they saw that really they they really needed a partner with with banks on. The, to your point around kind of the capital piece of it and, and some of the cash on hand and some of the um, that piece of it, the deposit play on this, you know, we're fortunate enough to have a warehouse lending unit that's that supports this kind of volatility because it, to your point, it is these funds that are crypto related are classified as vol- volatile deposits. So we really can't, we have to be very careful how we lend those out. And so fortunately we have that, that warehouse lending team that, that does have that ability to, to lend these funds out. But yeah, I mean, it's, we've had a number of conversations with some of the largest exchanges in the world, some of the biggest institutional players out there. Um, we support the crypto mining unit uh, industry. And we, we also work with um, the BTM space. A lot of the BTMs, out there, Bitcoin ATMs in the space are probably somebody that we're working with. So, you know, we saw the clear opportunities. We we designed our, our products and deposit space to kind of support those from an operational standpoint, but also a full-fledged digital asset, uh, digital asset account to support their needs. Um, but, you know, Prov Exchange, which is something you're referring to around the uh, the exchange portion, that was something we, we released this year. Uh, full API-driven real-time payments platform you know, it's it's something that that industry was in was in need of, right? They they need that constant twenty four seven ability to exchange some liquidity and things like that. So we offer that ability, very similar to what Silvergate and Signature Bank have in their products as well. But um, yeah, it's a very exciting time. Uh, our we've gotten a lot of good feedback from our clients and prospects on it, and, and you know we we see some other opportunities as we grow into next year on both the deposit and lending side. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, Silvergate and Signature, which are, you know, Silvergate on the West Coast, Signature on the East Coast that are, um, you know, have been in this space for a while, each of which have their own exchanges and have been seeing amazing earnings from this kind of business line. So curious about what about the space made BankProv feel like there was room for another player, that there was need for another exchange? Well, I mean, I think that's the one focus we we have is is really the niche markets and kind of the unbanked in particular. And you know, I, my background, I've been involved in crypto since 2014. I was fortunate enough to to stumble into what Bitcoin was back then at a conference, at a bankers conference, actually where I am today, out in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And um, back then, as you can imagine, people, the the presenter, people thought he was crazy. They didn't know what he was talking about, but. It was always an opportunity back then. And so I think what we saw was our focus point being exactly on that. It's, you know, this niche market that that clearly needs banking services that we feel we have the ability to support them on and provide those services for. Um, and that's something that we, we you know, fortunate enough to have our board back us on it. And, you know, Dave Mansfield, our CEO, really pushed that along. So, yeah. Yeah. Um- Curious too, you mentioned the Bitcoin ATM. I, did you call it a BTM? Yeah, so the BTMs, that's what they're called yeah. out there. Okay, very cool. Um, that's something that, you know, I, I don't know that a lot of our listeners might have exposure to, but it definitely is something that caught my eye in some of the recent earnings statements because that is one component of the amazing non interest income growth that you guys have had recently. I think right now margins are being squeezed, and so a lot of banks are really hungry for for new sources of non-interest income so you know just curious if you can talk a little bit about how that's contributed to the bank's growth yeah some of the parts there i mean non-interest income is a big focus point of ours um there are some banks out there that are charging negative interest as part of this and so one thing we want to do is be able to you know support the needs of our clients first and foremost but the non-interest income component of this is is huge right i think that's a, a big play that every bank is looking for um, the fee income associated with BTMs is is something that has been, you know, kind of a, a, a sweet spot for us at this point. I mean, it's something where they, the the individuals, the companies that are in that space need the services. We're partnering with, you know, some of the uh, armor car providers to open up vaults around the country to support the cash flow that's associated with that. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot on our end that needs to get to get done as well to support it. But the fee income is just a part of it. Um, you know, we're looking to grow that into next year. And again, some of these areas with BTMs being a big focus point of potential, um, that's something we're looking to certainly grow into next year and increase our, our uh, visibility into. 
Yeah. Not interest income is just a small part of what you guys are doing because you've also had an amazing loan growth in the last year. Um, so where is that coming from? Is that part of the crypto operation as well? Yeah. So we, we really have uh, a, a good opportunity. That's what we call a specialty lending group. So, you know, crypto fits into that and we've seen a, a significant growth in particular this quarter, um, you know, in, in some, some of the, you know, the last half of the year in, in that space. And so for us, it's really about um, just kind of honing in on that. And obviously we've got to be too, a little bit careful, not going too much focus on crypto and lending, but, you know, we have, a, we have enterprise value lending. We've got the mortgage warehouse unit, renewable energy, some of these other, um, you know, search fund lending, some of these other initiatives in there. So it's really niche driven. Um, in some of these areas that that help support that growth as well, but yeah, I mean we're, we're very uh, we're very excited about what next year is going to bring in that space as well. We've seen a lot of growth uh, in the second half of this year on that. Curious if you can talk a little bit about niche, the, the, I, how you go about identifying a niche opportunity. I think that that's you know one of the places that banks will need to focus to differentiate and to really compete and thrive over the next several years. But how do you even go about spotting a, a, a niche opportunity? You said, you know, the Bitcoin kind of fell into your lap in 2014 when everyone else was making fun of the idea and kind of, you know, sure. laughing at, at the craziness of it all. So what advice would you have for folks that are looking for opportunities to differentiate and find a niche? Well, I think we saw what fintechs did, right? I think fintechs were out there and said, okay, we don't have to specialize in everything out there, but we, what is it that, that clients, what is it that consumers and that commercial clients need? What's that gap that needs to be filled? And so, you know, that's really our focus point is, is listening to the client and really saying, okay, here's an opportunity to really focus on their needs. And that's really 100% what we focus on. It's the unbanked or underbanked in that space. And that niche, the niche component of it is, you know, we're out there in the market. We have a really talented team of, of employees here that can that can spot things out and really say, hey, have this conversation with this potential client. They're looking for this, and then that kind of spurs this conversation internally as we look at strategy and kind of goes from there. But you know, again, I think it's it's having just a really good network. It's it's being able to get out there and having um, a solid team to support the growth behind it. But it's challenging. It's not the easiest thing to really find a niche. But um, I think the one thing I could say is. A lot of times I've seen where, you know, folks are, are either hanging on too long to a niche and it's just not working. So having the ability to recognize that, hey, this is not working. We've got to really redirect our attention. Um, maybe there's another opportunity within that niche or not hanging on enough. Right. So it's having that right balance to say, you know, what is the time frame that you're comfortable with as an organization to see, uh, you know, this is where we're seeing benefits from this or opportunities come out of it. But there's a couple of concepts internally that we use to help support and drive home what those markets could uh, potentially be for us. Can you talk about those? Yeah, there's well, there's one that's out there called the flywheel concept. Really, it's putting it through this this idea of um, you know analyzing the opportunity, bringing in the right SMEs internally, subject matter experts in the space. Um, what are the risks associated with it? You know, what are we seeing as potential growth opportunities? Is it scalable? Um, we, we don't necessarily, we, we, you know, our focus point really is not necessarily just focusing on solving one issue, but could it could it broaden it out and, and solve issues for a number of clients that, that we're, you know, focusing on. So um, it's really having that broad approach, this flywheel concept. Um, and again, uh, the risk piece of it is critical in this space, just given the nature and the expectation from a regulatory perspective, but um, it's, it's worked for us so far. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um... You guys have also gotten into banking as we this recently, BAS, as we affectionately refer to it in the industry. Um, curious about that move because I feel like you know every other day we're seeing another bank, another middleware provider kind of jump into that space. What are your thoughts on on the opportunity there and the size of the market there and, and whether it might be a little overheated? Yeah, you know, it's there's still a lot of opportunity. I think it's um, particularly on the commercial side, right? I think may have gotten a little saturated in the consumer space. There's just a lot of products out there and services, but, you know, fortunately for us, we're in the commercial side um, and see some, some significant opportunities, almost like they were forgot about over these years. You know, and there's some pieces that, that can come in plug and play in the commercial space and the business side. But, you know, I think just vast opportunities, you know, really are just payment processing and digital asset exchanges and 
just what we've seen in niche and is really focusing on crypto best players as well. It's like this, this banking as a service function, but for crypto related companies. Um, and so that's, that's been a sweet spot for us as well. But um, you know, there's a lot that we're focusing on. We've got a, a couple partnerships that we've announced in the space and we have more that are coming uh, that we're excited about, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, kind of our nature. Some of, some of the folks I've had an opportunity to work with for a while have joined me here, uh, you know, and, and we've kind of all had that, that opportunity to, to work in the bass space and understand what the, the priorities are, what the pain points might be, um, you know, what's worked, what hasn't, and, and kind of taking that on here and, and, and laid the foundation for where we are today. Yeah. And I think you guys are working with Treasury Prime for that, correct? Yeah, we have a, we, Treasury Prime is one of our, our best partners in the space. Yeah, they, they're, you know, the recent winners of some some pretty significant awards and well-deserved there. But um, yeah, Treasury Prime, we, we kind of, we try to give ourselves kind of an agnostic approach to it, just seeing that um, a lot of these folks, in, in, you know, are coming from different cores and different uh, technology stacks that, you know, these plug and plays, the APIs are critical as part of it. But, you know, having more of an agnostic approach, but Treasury Prime is certainly a big partner of ours. Modern Treasuries and other that we're working with in the space, but the also the other part on the on the vast space that we create our own APIs to support this as well. So that'll be another opportunity. So really, it's it's truly that agnostic approach and and kind of plug and play as as the clients need. Creating your own APIs, I think that's something that um, again, all of this is so technical. I mean, building your own exchange, creating your own APIs you guys have gone through amazing growth in terms of the team that you need to pull this off. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, I think the approach that we saw in particular on technology was, um, you know, do we have the right staff? Do we have the right team to support that? Right. The first most obvious question that you ask yourself and, and we certainly do. And, and uh, the confidence that they have in not only building, but ensuring that we're building it according to what we're expected to have in place from a regulatory perspective, because, you know, you can bring in folks from all over the place and they have a lot of talent, but we also have to make sure that from a compliance and, and all that stuff, that's all that's all figured into this as well. But um, yeah, I mean, we saw the opportunity to, to do this. And, you know, I think part of it was with Prov Exchange and that's just a, a portion of it. I mean, we have an opportunity for, you know, to eventually release ACH wire, our own virtual ledger uh, APIs. And that's something that we've um, got a solid team in our background. And really from a technical bill, but also security, some of that uh, functionality that comes with that and make sure we've covered um, the risk associated with, with doing that ourselves. And you did this all on a COCC core, right? We're a COCC core, yep. Uh, Fiserv DNA is the, is the core and, and uh, COCC wraps it. And, and, okay. and fortunately for us, I mean, COCC really helped us in the space because their core is real time and allows us to, to you know, conduct this activity. And, um, you know, it's it's... It's just one of the benefits of having that partnership. Yeah. Well, clearly a ton going on at BankProv. I don't even know how to, you know, how you wrap your head around everything that's going on in terms of new projects. What's what's on? The, dare I ask? What's on the horizon for 2022? Um, we have a lot. We just got off our, you know, finalizing our strategy for next year. Uh, a lot of exciting things, but I think really focusing on. Alignment, that's something we throw out there. It's just from, from the top down, just ensuring that um, everyone's on the same page, you know, internally and that our, you know, our um, uh, investors and folks alike can make sure that we're all doing the same thing and that they're, that they're appreciating our, our offerings. And, um, but the big thing for us is really just having the right product services to have uh, to offer, right? So that's the continuing to be our focus point for next year. It's um, at offering additional services, additional products, to better suit the clients in the space. And, um, and that's, you know, that's just a portion of it and lending niches, some other opportunities there on the deposit side. So we're, we're excited about what's to come next year. Um, there's a lot to come, so stay tuned, but, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be busy year. this year flew by. I'm sure for everybody else too, but, uh, it's pretty amazing how fast the time flies. We have fun. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Joe Mancini, again, EVP and Chief Operating Officer for BankProv. It's been a pleasure and, and we wish you tons of luck in the new year. Thanks, Amber. Same to you. And it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to catch up. Yeah. Have a great day. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. 
We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.